So Caleb did a, um, a little intro to what we've been talking about, uh, building our house, building God's house. And one of the things that the senior booths did last week, which was great, um, was talk about family values where Jesus is Lord and we need to be ready to do the hard things. And I don't know if that resonated with you guys. If you guys haven't seen the series, please take the time. We actually have it online for you guys to see it. But it is a, it is a great reminder of what God is doing and what he is about to do. Amen? So, guys, before we get into the word, I, I wanted to take this opportunity. And I'm pretty proud of my family. We've been together for a really long time. So, hey, guys, can we cue the photos? This is, this is going back... This is going back long, long time ago. It's about actually 32 years, a little over 31, 32 years ago. So that morning I had auditioned for Miami Vice. <laughs> and I didn't get the part, okay? And I still uh, have some of that Aquanet hairspray. Uh, well, at the end of the day, I don't hold any grudges. God is bigger in that situation. Hey, can we hold, can we go to the next photo? Is that all right? So this is our, our this is our, our most recent photo, and uh, thank you. So my wife and I have been married. We're going on 27 years, and we've been together for 35. So if you guys have been praying for Linda, it's working. Poor thing. 35 years with me. That's a long time. But with the church, with Turning Point, 19 years. We've been with we've been with Turning Point for 19 years. We've been serving on eldership for nine. Oh, by the way, uh, that's the day that we renewed our vows. So Pastor Kevin renewed our vows, and, and we actually did it here. So that was really cool. So I just wanted to share a little bit. I hope that was okay. Just a little, a little family history. Um, what was interesting about us, when we winded the clocks back to 1985, that's when I met my wife. Okay? That's a long time ago, right? Some of you guys weren't even born. That's all right. But... You know, I knew that there was something special about my wife. It, it was really interesting. God showed me when I was 15 two things, who I was going to marry and what I was going to be doing in life. And I'll be honest, I ran from both because it was really scary. It's like, okay, you're showing me this beautiful woman. How am I going to take care of her? And, Lord, you want me to preach the word. Don't you know my past? And the Lord says, yes, I know your past, but I'm going to use your past. It's like, wow. Okay, so soon after my wife and I met, um, we actually had our oldest daughter, Jessica, who is now 32 years old, okay? There she is up here in the front. <laughs> and so, and then a few years after that, we got married. So check this out. The first seven years of our marriage was kind of rocky. Oh. Let's tell, the church, let's tell the truth in okay, church. It was right. very rocky. Okay, it was very rocky. I'm glad, I, I'm glad my wife is up here to balance things. I'd like to do this. We're in church, Yeah. So it was very rocky. It was very rocky. You know, the, the, the D word, and I don't mean dog, but the D word was mentioned a lot, divorce, right? And so what's interesting is that my wife and I came from different backgrounds, Seventh-day Adventist, Catholic. We both knew who God was. We prayed right? But interestingly enough, my parents got divorced when I was 14. Linda's parents still married 55 years, right? That's huge, right? And Linda would often kid and say, mom, dad, you tricked me. You tricked me. Your marriage was great. It was full of laughter and romance and my marriage isn't. And I'm like, oh my God. The first seven years was like that. But if you put your finger on it, you realize that God wasn't in the marriage the first seven years. Just being honest. So now that God's been there, look where we're at, right? And for him to use me and use my wife and to use our family to serve God, that could, that's only possible because of God. Amen? So let, let's look at this here real quick. So um, two individuals with completely different ideas and expectations of marriage trying to be one flesh. Ephesians 5.31 says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. That is a great reminder on how Christ and the church are one. Yes? So, guys, we're going to get into the word today. We're going to be reading from Song of Solomon. That is the 22nd book in the Old Testament. And that's exactly what it sounds like, the Song of Solomon. 
The theme is authentic love, the love that God has for us. The Song of Solomon uses beautiful pictures of romance, marriage, and intimacy, but from God's point of view. He's talking about a, 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 an agreement, a, a covenant, thank you, a covenant with God and man, right? And it expresses what God has in store for us. So if you guys can get your Bibles out or your electronic devices, and we're going to go to Song of Solomon, uh, chapter 2, verse 14. And this is where Solomon is speaking to his love. Check this out. He says, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice. For your voice is pleasant and your face is lovely. That's such a familiar voice. It, it basically says, come boldly without worry. Love that. And she responds to him by saying, catch all the foxes, those little foxes, before they ruin the vineyard of love, for the grapevines are blossoming. Many times in our relationships, we focus on the obvious, the huge obstacles and trials. I love this verse. It reminds us to watch out for the sneaky, sly little fox who comes in to destroy the vineyards. Many times it's the little things, it's the minor issues that when ignored or undealt with yes. Yes. can cause great harm in our relationships. Amen. So the woman asked her love, can you deal with, can you deal for us those little foxes? Yes. Could you tend to our relationship yes. so those little things don't yes. do big damage? Yes. The vine represents all the good fruit of a healthy marriage. And so some of the good fruit is love, trust, mutual respect, intimacy, forgiveness, compatibility, shared values, teamwork, kindness. You know, just think of your marriage and your relationship and some of the fruit, some of the goodness in it. And the fox comes to destroy the good fruit. And as Sergio was saying, we've been uh, here at Turning Point for about 20 years. And it was really a life-changing, a turning point for us. And when we got here, um, when we made this our home church, and we were finally sharing one faith that was really awesome, uh, we started serving, right? And so the first ministry we served in was donut ministry. No, no, no. You're not going to tell that story. I didn't. Yeah, sure. So donut ministry. Now, Sergio was probably benching about 450 at the time, and he was, you know, out there at the donut table, and he said, how can I help you? Like that. And um, it was really intimidating for people because it was really sad. We, the goal of donut ministry was to make people feel welcome, new people to the church, like, hi, get connected. And he was like, how can I help you? And they're, like, feeling, you know, like, embarrassed about getting a donut surge. I didn't have my protein this morning. And so, anyway, donut sales it went down. It wasn't that bad. Donut sales went down, and we were released from donut ministry. So... The next ministry we, uh, we got involved in was, um, was children's ministry. Children's ministry. Yeah, yeah. And we were serving in children's ministry, and it was Christmas time, and there was a, um, a party, a Christmas party, yeah. honoring all the children's ministry workers. And this is a true story. So we're there, and, uh, and we're playing an icebreaker, and our founding pastors were there, and the game, they're looking at me like, what is she going to say? Oh, yeah. And um, ready, we're playing baby. that game, Never Have I Ever. And I don't know if you guys have ever played Never Have I Ever. If there's different versions in it, what have you, but we were playing Never Have I Ever, and there were less chairs than there were people. And the goal was, you know, to be eliminated eventually That's and be having a chair. That's the goal. So we were playing Never Have I Ever, you know, um, peed why sneezing. And then you, if you did that, you had to get up and move. And so, number one, you're kind of getting to know each other's embarrassing things. And number two, um, you know, you're trying to play this game. So the person says, never have I ever been in a physical fight. And so I'm sitting in my chair comfortable. I'm like, I ain't getting up. And out of the corner of my eye, I see Pastor Kevin, our founding pastor, beelining his way in my direction. I'm like, never have I. And I'm like, what? This is a true story. I'm like, what is it? What? And I'm looking around. And the next thing I know, he's hovering over me. Like, I'm going to get up and move. And I looked up at him and I said, Pastor, I'm a lover, not a fighter. And, um, and for the most part, that has always been true. I, I am a lover, not a fighter. But in the first few years of marriage, I'm embarrassed to say that uh, the first fox I'd like to introduce us is the fighting fox. I used to want to fight to win. That was my goal. And so Psalms 34, 14, it says, turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Yep. Romans 12, 18 says, do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. I'm <clears throat> sorry, my throat. It has taken me years to have a revelation that when you are fighting a loved one to win, there is really no winning at all. I used to argue with Sergio with a goal to win. It was almost like I wanted him to completely comply with what I wanted. Linda, this is my, how I expected it to go in my mind. Linda, you are so right. 
and I am so wrong. And I am so thankful you showed me the error in my ways, and I want to do everything the way you say it should be done. That's kind of what, I, what my goal was. But I could probably count on a couple of fingers how many times in 30 years that really happened. That wasn't, no, it's not that much. The truth is, there is going to be conflict. The goal with conflict is to have resolution and reconciliation, Amen. not to carry today's issues into our tomorrows. Amen. The good news is all conflict, all conflict, no matter what it is, can produce intimacy. It could take you into a deeper level of intimacy with your spouse. Amen. Yep. Sergio and I used to have fights that went absolutely nowhere. When we learned how to transform our fights into opportunities for intimacy, our marriage was revitalized. The problem isn't conflict, it's what you do with it. The same argument can produce intimacy yes. or division. Conflict through the mind of Christ allows me to die to myself, my will, my agenda, my way, and that produces intimacy. If it's my will versus his will, we are headed for disaster. <laughs> But if we fight for God's will, our relationship is strong and transformed. So some tips for fighting. Set boundaries ahead of time. Even boxers get in the ring. If you're a sports fan, boxers get in the ring. Please don't do that. Oh. Um, <laughs> even boxers have guidelines. I'm just and, trying to help. Just trying to help. Before stepping into the ring. I appreciate it. I am a visual learner, but don't do that. It's important not to say things in the heat of the moment. Once they've left your mouth, you can't shove them back in. Yeah. It might be a good idea to take some time to cool off if you're really upset. Mm. Take the D word off the table. Yes. As Sergio was saying, it was actually at a, either a sermon similar to this or at a marriage event we went through at Turning Point where we would still threaten each other that there was the door. And once we decided that we would take that word out of our vocabulary, it was no longer, we made a conscious decision. Divorce is, is no longer an option in our life. We can no longer mention it. There is no way out. We made a covenant and a promise to God till death do us part. Amen. It, was, uh, it was freeing because it was almost like I could be more vulnerable because we're not going to leave. We're in it till death do us part. Amen. So take the D word off the table. Amen. Don't play the blame game. Own your part in it. You know, a lot of times we could find ourselves saying, well, I did that because you did this. Well, if you didn't do that, I wouldn't have done this. Yeah, yeah. Don't play the blame game. Just own what you've done so that you could get healing and That's move so forward. Good. That's so good. That's so good. Distinguish what can be overlooked and what needs to be addressed. I like to call this kind of focusing on the things of eternal value. There were little things in the beginning marriages and when I used to threaten the D word a lot, maybe it's dirty clothes left on the floor. I was like, I didn't know I was signing up for this. You know, I was expecting just a fairy tale happily ever after. Or um, some of you have been in marriage ministry, I have to mention all the time, because it was such a big deal and I've been free from it, praise God. But he used to use peanut butter on a spoon to serve on his toast. I still do, I still do. Well, I'm free from it, because I don't even recognize it anymore. Oh, thank God, thank you, Lord. But it's like, really, one day, it used to drive me nuts, like really, truly nuts, because anyway, I won't go there, but. It, but it spread so nicely on the bread. And it was gross, and you put the, okay, we'll leave it alone. But really, truly, when you focus on the things of eternity, what really matters? It's the little thing. I mean, we're talking about the little foxes, but I'm yes. talking like the little habits and the things. If you could take it to Jesus and let it die there, do so. Amen. You know, you don't want to nitpick. Amen. And then give grace, grace, and more Thank grace. You. Thank you. And then when you've given that grace, give even more. Ephesians 4, 23 says, throw off your old sinful nature and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception. Instead, let the spirit renew your thoughts and attitudes. That's really, really good. It's not enough, babe, right, to, to shake things off. We need to write them on the tablets of our heart. You know, I'm, I'm afraid to, uh, I'm ashamed to say it. Linda, I don't, have you guys ever heard that? Don't let the sun go down on your anger. You guys have heard that before, right? And so... It's interesting, I used to take that to heart, and I, I would be in front of Linda's house, at that point I had already moved away, and I had to you know, make my point, I want my point to be heard, right? But sometimes we would be out there for hours in front of my orange 71 bug, and we would be arguing, and then here comes Linda's dad out of the door, and just with his arm, 
with a white hanky saying, okay. Break it up. Break it up. You can see her tomorrow and you can resume this whole argument. Yeah. And I just had this thing of like, you know what? I need to let it, I need to take care of it today. But I'll be honest with you, that wasn't working. For you guys who play baseball or know baseball, my batting average at that point was 200. That's not good. <laughs> That's not good. So no, great point with regards to, you know, the first fox, which is the fighting fox. The second fox is the poor communication fox. Matthew 12, 36 says, every, every idle word that man speaks, he will give an account on judgment day. So I really feel that the Lord is saying words matter. Yeah. Words really, really matter. And I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to stand before the Lord in the, in, in, with the silver screen with all the, the idle words that I've ever spoken. Surround sound going, and he's about to introduce what I've said. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, every idle word. So I'm thinking HBO, HBO. And he's like, HBO, yeah, help a brother out. Not, not home box office, help a brother out. Because every idle word, oh, that's tough. That's tough. And you know what? Every idle word, and if it's not, if it's not God's word, then that's poor communication, right? So this was all about character, talking more then I listen. I don't know about you guys. Maybe I'm the only person here that likes to talk more than I listen. Pastor Caleb talked about how we have two ears and one mouth. But I got to be honest, babe, sometimes I forget that. It's, it's something that I struggle with, Thank right? You. Because yeah. I, I, I want to be heard, right? And if I am not being heard, guess what? Resentment comes in and it stays. And I want that resentment like the fox. Que te vayas. Go. <laughs> I, don't, I don't need you here. I don't need you here, right? So that, that is poor communication. In James 1, 5, it says, if any of you, okay, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who does what? He gives generously Amen. to all without reproach, and it will be given. So that was great timing for me to have that word because I'm like, okay, my way is not working. My way, batting 200, that is not working. I need more of God. I need to be, I need God's word in me. Does that make sense? I need God's word in me. So guys, I want to give you guys some tools because I really feel when you hear verses like James 1.5, it's spiritual understanding. It goes beyond the 1.0 or the 2.0. It's spiritual understanding. It's what God's giving us from heaven for us. And that's special, Right? So let's go over some tools, if you guys don't mind, with regards to effective communication, because like I said, I don't need that fox there. So the first tool, guys, let's talk about this, is talk to your spouse by doing three things. The DFW. I like acronyms, okay? So sorry for those who don't, but I'm sorry, but I do. So HBO, thank you so much. So desires, feelings, and wants. It's okay to talk to your spouse about those, right? Now, are they going to change? They probably are going to change. I mean, it's changed over the course of the 35 years that we've been together. But let me just say this. When you're sharing with your spouse and you're focusing on your, your desires, feelings, and wants, that is not a time to be talking about their faults. Don't bring the faults in there, right? Just talk about your desires, feelings, and wants. So that was the first tool. The second tool is listen to your spouse during the communication without... Okay? without anticipating your turn to speak. So this is how I would be. My wife would be talking, and I couldn't wait for her to, let, to stop because I wanted to get in there and say, yeah, but, but no, but, yes, but, yes, yes, but. And I was just chomping at the bit. And th that would be distracting to my wife, and I wasn't honoring the relationship at that point. That wasn't good communication. That was poor communication. So, guys, what we need to do there is listen to our spouse during the communication without anticipating our turn to speak. And, guys, the last tool with regards to defeating the, the fox, the poor communication fox, is repeat things back. This avoids misunderstanding. And I just want to take a minute here and, and give an example. This has been working in our marriage for the last couple years is repeating things back. And I don't mean a broken record because nobody likes a broken record. But to repeat things back, 
So what I hear you saying is this. So here's a perfect example. My wife and I are going to go on a road trip, right? We have the 80s music because, you know, I'm an 80s guy, okay? So got the 80s music set up. We got our drinks set up. But I show up 30 minutes late. So what am I, what am I going to do? I'm going to try to make up some time because we're already late. So I'm going in and out of traffic. I'm breaking laws. She's feeling uneasy. We're not really having a good conversation. Forget whatever music is on because at that point, she's just hanging on. It's like this roller coaster to get us there. And you know what she says? She says, honey, the next time we go on the trip, can you get here half hour early? And I'm like, okay, so, you know, I'm, I don't want to get upset. Oh, is it my driving? No. What she's trying to get me to understand is, hey, get there 30 minutes earlier, right? Let's enjoy our time. And so when I repeat things back to her, then we're avoiding miscommunication. Does that make sense, guys? So we're avoiding miscommunication, right? And this is what I love. I become fluent in words, but also in communication. Yeah, that's so good, hon. Um, some of the things also is to say what you mean and mean what you say. A lot of times when it comes to communication, we either talk in code, you know what I mean? Or we do this thing of, well, he should know how I feel or she should know what I want. We don't. We're different. You know what I mean? We're made differently. God created us differently. So it's important to say what you mean and mean what you say and then being able to take words at face value. So um, that's one thing that I, I'm, I'm still working on. There's a lot of things we haven't arrived, but we work towards is, uh, you know, sometimes I think Sergio will say, no, I don't want you to do this for me. And I'm thinking, well, he doesn't really mean no. He just thinks that he doesn't really, he's not going to tell me no because he thinks I don't have the time and blah, blah, and I'll do it. And he'll go, why'd you do that? I'm like, well, I thought that's what you wanted. And then I feel unappreciated. So I'm learning to take things that you say at face value. That's good, man. Very good. And then help your spouse out. Don't expect them to read your mind. Please help your spouse out. <laughs> Please. The hints yep. are golden. Okay. The older you get, they're golden. The next box we're going to talk about is a lack of intimacy, physical and emotional. And so uh, Hollywood would like you to think it's either working or it's not. There's chemistry or there's not. Um, a couple must continuously talk about sexual expectations and desires. And I say continually because... Seasons are always changing. Yeah. You have childbearing years, you have different work seasons, you have you know, perimenopause, menopause, I turn 50, I speak a little experience on that. <laughs> so there's constantly things changing and the bedroom actually is a place that you're able to serve your spouse. First Corinthians says, um, in 7.3 says, a husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. That's my favorite verse, by the way. I didn't even know that verse existed until we were studying for this word. Favorite verse. He's lying. Favorite. And it said, but Favorite. actually you won't be able to if disappointment or hurt balloons up into a major issue. God created sex and recognizes its importance. Scripture contains numerous guidelines for its use and its misuse. Mm. Sex is always mentioned um, between a loving relationship between a husband and a wife. God wants sex to be motivated, motivated by love and commitment. It is for mutual pleasure, not selfish enjoyment. Communicating and keeping an open mind are key to getting through any form of sexual incompatibility or tough seasons. It can reestablish the physical and emotional bonds that are crucial for sexual intimacy to flourish. So, you know, a lot of times we hear the, um, the saying that men are like microwaves when it comes to this, and women are like crockpot. So, uh, word to the wise for these men this morning, you know, get your crockpot started early in the morning. Yep. And it could look different all yep. the time. So, when I, when I say that, we all have different love languages. It's getting hot in here, what I'm saying. Um, yeah. Can you guys make it a little cooler? <laughs> We're feeling the heat over here. Yeah. Um, love language, uh, speaking to this, you know, we all have a love language and there is a test you could take to find out what your love, the five languages of love, you could Google it. But, um, and I want to give you guys also a hint, love languages change. Sergio used to feel like I messed with him because he would finally get onto my love language, which was in our early years, acts of service. We had young children and if he could do things it. to take things off my plate, I felt blessed. So it's like one morning I remember just recently, well, I'm like, a couple years ago, he got up and he cleaned the house and everything. And he's like, man, I, you know, cleaned the house for you today. And I was like, oh, that's honey. You shouldn't have wasted your time. And he was like, shouldn't have wasted my time. And he's like, I'm speaking your love language. I'm like, mm, no, not anymore. That, you know, yeah. now we have older, now we have older kids. You see that what I mean clean. by hint? Yeah. You see what I mean? 
now we have older kids that could do some of that work. So actually my love language has changed to quality time and words of affirmation. So our love language are always changing, but we want to make sure that we're speaking a love language to each other. And, and we've learned over the years, it's not, you know, sometimes we think of things that just happen within the bedroom, but the intimacy and the vulnerability comes through an emotional connection. And that comes Amen. from connecting with your spouse throughout the day, a text, I'm thinking of you, yeah. you know, I love you. Sergio and I, I, for a while now, I've been playing um, this thing, well, it's not playing, but we just send a, a, like a, a picture of one another that we've taken over the years, just something fun on vacation and everything. And it's like, I'm thinking of you, and we'll send a little capture underneath it and things like that. And I think that just sends encouragement that I'm thinking of you, I, I love you, you know. And, and, and it's so true. You know, I used to think that foreplay was just in the bedroom. And it's not. It's during the day, right? It's planning our next vacation. It's saying yes to the vacation my wife already planned without me knowing, right? <laughs> I mean, Amen. of course, that never Amen. happens, okay? That never, ever happens, okay? But the next four in the next six months, that's how it is. So, yeah. you know, you just go with it, that's right? Good. But, I mean, foreplay means a little, something a little different for us now, right? And I think that what we're really doing is stepping into a season where God wants us to be this way. Yeah. So, it's, it, it's a great thing. So, guys, uh, oh, babe, thank you so much for the third fox. So, the fourth fox is the procrastinating fox, and guys, I'm probably not going to make any friends, any new friends. <laughs> and the friends that I do have, I'm sorry, but we're gonna, we need to talk about procrastination. Yeah. Now, maybe you guys have it down, and, and that's great. But for me, this is something that, to be honest with you, it's whip. It's a work in progress. I'm always going to be working on this. Let's read from Ephesians 5.17. It says, don't act thoughtlessly, but understand what the Lord wants you to do. So let's talk about procrastination. Let's talk about putting things off and not getting it done. You know, I used to ask myself, is it a really big deal that I don't do the things that I tell my wife I'm going to do? Is it a big deal that the list just gets bigger and bigger? I mean, that really shouldn't create any foxes in our marriage. She shouldn't really be mad at me. She knows how busy I am. There was a season where I had two jobs, sometimes three jobs, right? And so it's kind of like, well, that to-do list, it'll be there, you know, just let me get to it. And, but, you know, let me, let me tell you what it was doing. It was creating division between us, right? The little foxes were coming in. And like I told you guys before, I don't need any more foxes in my life, right? So I needed to deal with this fox. So the little foxes, they messed things up. It was my procrastination. It was uh, my putting things off. Not, not only would it frustrate my wife, but others. Asking my wife to put off important things that would make our marriage strong, yeah, that's letting the foxes in. So let me just say this about prayer and foxes. God created marriage, this platform of marriage, so prayer would be there on a constant basis. And not just with her or for her, but for you guys, right, as we stand with you guys. But if I keep procrastinating about prayer because I'm busy and I'm convincing myself of my schedule. I don't know about you guys, but if I convince myself of something, I can unconvince myself like this real quick. I can go back and forth like a ping pong ball. I could, but I need to have a decided heart. If the Lord's calling me to less or no procrastination, then that's what it's got to be. So guys, so here's the thing with that. Don't procrastinate when it comes to prayer, right? Matthew 18, 19 says, stay dressed for what? For action and keep your lamps burning. I love the imagery of this because this is men tucking their long robes in, into their belt. And what are they ready to do? They're ready to begin. They're ready to take care of business. And I really feel that God's calling us into that season about less procrastination to no procrastination. Does that make sense, guys? so many things that you could procrastinate, you know, your to-do list, tough conversations, and the procrastination, like you're saying, it's a, a fox to deal with because you want to deal with yeah. things today as they come up so you could move on, right? Absolutely. And let me just say this. I know that sometimes we get worried about, you know, the things that are going on. In Matthew 6, what does it talk about? It talks about don't worry. It talks about that. And I'd like to, I'd, I'd like to leave with this point here is this, that I know that procrastination is out there. I get it. But remember the God that we serve. 
He doesn't procrastinate. Mm, he takes care of business. Amen. He's looking out for us. So I hope you. I hope that was. In, I hope you guys That's were good. encouraged Thank by you, that hun. by that fox. That's awesome. Um, the next fox we want to talk about this morning is not pri prioritizing your spouse. Yeah. And I like to call this the second fiddle fox. Ephesians 5:22 it says, "For wives, this means submit to your husbands as to the Lord." And Ephesians 5:25 says, "For husbands, this means love your wives just as Christ loved the church." I love those scriptures as an example because it's it's kind of like A and B. You know, we could submit to our husbands because they're loving us so much that Christ loved the church so much that he died for her. And so there's something safe when I could submit to underneath Sergio's leadership because of the way he leads our home. So it's like A and B. They go together hand in hand. Mm. And the truth about time is you don't have time. You make time yes. for what's important to you. Very good. If you want a healthy marriage, then your spouse needs to be a priority. Your mate is going to know if he or she is important and a priority by the way you make them feel, by your actions. It's not by what we say a lot of times, it's by what we do. Right. Right. Nobody likes to feel like last night's leftovers. Yeah. Mm. Think of all the things that compete for your time. I mean, just there's a list. It could be our kids, commitments, ministry, hobbies, obligations, appointments. There's a lot of things, friends, then they're not bad things, a lot of things that stretch us for our time. Um, but your spouse needs to be one of your top, the top, outside of God, your top relationship Thank priority. You. Thank you. Man. And so um, some helpful hints to prioritizing your spouse is, I like this, calendar your dates like a million dollar meeting. It's on your calendar. Oh, here we go again. Stop that. He's trying to help. He's trying to help. <laughs> I'm a visual learner, but that's distracting. It really is. Um, so those meetings, those dates, nights that you put on the calendar, make them important. And it's not the first thing to raise. We noticed that when we got into a busy season, it was like, oh, you know, we had a, a date night on Thursday night. And it was like the first thing that we did race because another obligation or a commitment would come in. This cannot be the case. And, can I, and when I'm speaking into a date night with your spouse, a lot of times we think elaborate. You know, we think that we have to, date night has to be something grand, you know, it's like the five course meal, you know, we have to do A, B, C. No, it's quality, undistracted, uninterrupted time together. Yes. And can I say, when you're out on a date or when you're having quality time, no devices. Put them away. I mean, even not in your presence, not in, unless you're expecting like, a, you know, a really important million dollar call, don't even take them into your date because they're distractions. Sergio and I like to people watch, and we actually enjoy it. We go, and that's something we like to do. We're like, what are they doing? And we like make stories that we do that too, where they're eating dinner, we're like, oh, they met, and this is the situation, so we like to do that a lot. But one of the things that always surprises us is when couples, you could tell this, obvious that they're on a date, they're holding hands or whatever, they spend more time on their phone than they do with one another. And they're not prioritizing one another. And you can't get deeper. You can't get more vulnerable, you know, with a distraction. And, you know, you might be in a good conversation, then ding. And, and I've done it. I'm guilty. And I'll, like, look, and I'll look at my phone. And, and it sort of just sees me looking at my phone, and he's on. And then he's watching to see what I'm going to do. And I'm like, oh. And he's like, go ahead and answer. I'm like, no, it's okay. So if I don't have it near me, it's not going to call my name. No cell phones when you're on a date. Make sure, like, like, the days when you used to court. I, I can't even tell you when we were dating... Uh, at one point, he lived in Glendale. Oh. I lived in Roland Heights. And he used to, how many miles is that? Uh, Glendale about, to Roland Heights, whatever it was. Uh, probably about 47. 47 miles, he used to, he didn't have a car. So he would bike ride to come see me and, and just be there like with flowers. I don't know where he got the flowers from, probably at the local corner because they'd be dead the, if they came from Glendale. The, the neighbors. I the neighbors, okay. The neighbors, yeah. But you know, and he would ride his bike. This made me literally feel so important. So we don't want to stop the courting. Well, once we get married, it's like, well, here I am. We want to continue putting our best face forward, giving our all, right? Amen. So, <clears throat> sorry, honey. Be present and available. Amen. So, um, again, we learn as we go. And it's just like with our kids. My kids are, you know, they've gotten old fast. I don't know where time has went. And our marriage is ticking. You know, I'm not putting you in the grave. Don't worry, honey. I'm just saying, you know, time's I'm just going some fast. Dirt on me right now. Time is going fast. And so be present and available. You know, a lot of times when it comes to marriage, we think of, you know, our to-do list. And I can't tell you, I, I, there's regret, you know, when I look back. 
because you can't get time back. Where I look back and I think Sergio used to say, hey, you know, come watch the sunset. Or he would, he, you could hear him laughing. He watches things over and over at the DVR. And he'd ha, ha, and he'd, and he'd go, honey, come watch. I don't watch any TV. So it was a chore. And I'd be like, and you know, and he would know, I'd rather do the dishes than come watch TV. But now I know, you know what, he wants me to enjoy it. It's funny to him. So I want to be part of it. And so I'll take the time. Okay, I'm watching. And then I'll sit down and I, oh, that's funny. Okay, <laughs> now I'm going to go back to my dishes. But be present and available. And then finally, on this point, well, wait, give... Wait, 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 is there another point you got here? Yeah, give, give sorry, and be your best. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Okay, give and be your best. And, you know, I, again, being vulnerable up here, and just because we haven't arrived and we're not a finished work, Sergio used to tell me, Linda, I get your leftovers. You give 110% to everything else, and I feel like, you know, you're tired or no energy or, you know, it's like you have all this and you're, you know, I get off the phone and he's and I'm like, what, babe? What do you want? What do you want to go on a date? Okay. You know, and, and he's so like, I want you to give me your best. You're all. So I make a conscious effort. If we're going to spend time together, I try to make it count. Yeah. I try. You do. You do. I try. Okay. Yeah. All right. No, that's really good. So, guys, um, there are seasons in my life and there are seasons in your guys' life where yeah, there's busy. You take on a project and you're like that French juggler that's got this place spinning and then you got this place spinning and you got this place spinning, but then you want your spouse to kind of hang with you and be with you, right? Anybody like that? Oh, okay, three of you. Okay, that's cool. All right. All right, but, but picture this, okay? So my wife, as busy as she is, she's ministering. She's doing God's work. That's the bottom line. And I don't want to compete with that. So let me, let me do what Bugs Bunny used to say. Some of you guys don't know who Bugs Bunny and Looney Tunes. I'm going to date myself. I don't care. But he used to say, if you can't beat them, join them, right? But he also said, then beat them. But the point was is that let me join my wife. Let me partner with her in the things that she's doing, right? Then we get to spend time together, right? Now, I get it, the leftover thing, and I, I, gotta have, I have to be wise with the words that I'm using, right? Because even though that may be correct in my book, I need to choose my words a little better, right? But at the end of the day, I see value in partnering with my wife when she's busy in life, right? It may be not ideal, but that is the real thing at that time. Yeah, and that actually has spoken to my love bank over the years is that partnership that you come into the season they're in and you support, you know, and I think that goes to even dreaming together and all that. And so... That's awesome. And uh, as we're landing and getting ready to close, I'd like to mention the, another fox. And I think we're guilty in our own, our own each individual ways. And the sixth fox is the feelings fox. And it's basically letting our feelings in a relationship dictate our actions. Mm. Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool gives vent to spirit, but a, uh, but a wise man quietly holds back. You know, and uh, one of some helpful hints towards the feeling fox is pause and think before you act. You know, uh, take a minute to kind of like assess the situation and don't just act on our emotions. Pause and think. I like to think about pray. You know, take it to the Lord before you act. And then learn to process your emotions. A lot of times, if you know we're going off our feelings, we just, you know, act. And a lot of times, I, I know when it comes to feelings, it's like, well, I don't think he deserves I, you're not worthy, you know, you didn't earn, you know, and we use words like that in marriage and it shouldn't be, you know, when we're really truly trying to do it God's way and the way Jesus designed marriage to be, right. it's right. like I can selfish, self-sacrificially, self, self there we go, that's a hard word, self-sacrificially, um, serve and love and adore you because God's called me to, not because if I feel like it or not, there's a lot of times I don't feel like it. There's a lot of times you don't feel like it because we're not easy and it's, and it's not easy. It's hard and I'm still mad at my parents. Parents, I love you, but you tricked me. A marriage. And then um, the other thing is to think and focus on the good. You know, a lot of times we can easily just focus on the negative and the hard. And I remember you in the beginning years, when we go back to those first seven years before we came to Turning Point, before we'd surrendered to doing it God's way, um, we did mention divorce a lot and just being vulnerable. And Sergio used to tell me, you know, when it's a hard time, and I say this to other marriages, if you're going through a hard time, it's not a time to always assess. I don't want to talk about procrastination. These are different. But when you're going through a difficult time in your marriage, it's not always a good idea to say, well, how's our marriage doing? You're in a trial. You're in a difficult time. It's not always the best time to assess. Yeah, we, yeah I mean, we need to weather the storm. Yeah. We need to make sure that we're in it together. And then at some point later, we can assess 
you know, what we could do. That is, that, that is a big thing. After an event, when we used to do all these events, on the way home, I'm asking, what could we have done better? But not as a critique, but just as an opportunity to do better the next time, yeah. right? But if you're, in, if you're in the tempest, if you're in a storm, yeah. that is not the best time to be asking about the relationship, right? Because we're going to get through this. Yeah. What God put, what God put together, no man, Amen. and no man will separate. Yeah, that really helped us. And so Philippians four eight says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing: fix your thoughts on what is true, and honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And then the other point to not letting our feelings dictate our actions in our marriage is. Learn to forgive and move on. Mm. Ephesians 4.32 says, Instead, be kind to each other, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. Amen. Yeah. Uh, I, I love that. Uh, you know, sometimes, let, let's be honest, it's a really hard thing to do, right? But we don't need to do it alone. We need Christ there alongside us, right? Because when our cups are empty... Right? When our cups are empty, then what do we go with? We go on fumes. Then we go back to the 200 batting average. And I don't, I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to be at the 200 batting yeah. average. I need to do better than that. Right? That's good, babe. One of the things um, that um, it's so interesting, you and I were reminiscing about um, when we were in youth ministry. And uh, there was a, you remember that? <laughs> you remember that? Uh, Andrew Brown. Andrew Brown had a teaching, and I'll never forget this teaching. Him and I spent some time developing the teaching, but he, he, his topic was having a decided heart. And when you have a decided heart, a lot of decisions are being made. In children's ministry, they say, look, if the kids know that we are going to church Sunday morning, it's done. Yeah. Right? It is a done thing. Right? When we have a date, it is a done thing. Right? But when we have God in our lives and he's in the center of our decision making it's a it's done it's decided then what we need to do is just wait on him right we need to wait on him yeah that's so good um so those are some foxes that we came up with that you know are common foxes that over the 35 years or so have come up in our uh, relationship there's probably a trillion more that we didn't mention this morning but i hope it's a good um launching point for you and your spouse to get together and say hey you know it, it was really um it, it didn't cause any conflict when we were talking about it because it was really easy to say, hey, there's these foxes. They come in. They come to try to destroy the good fruit within our marriage. So maybe you have different foxes that we didn't mention tonight, and it's a good opportunity to communicate. What are they, and what are, can you do to get rid of them? Because you want to, it's those, like I said, the foxes is sneaky, and he's sly because he comes in, and he tries to uh, sneak, not in like a, a sneaky way, rob the good fruit and the love that's within the marriage. And so you wanna make sure that you identify them, deal with them so that you could continue to move in unity. And not that we've arrived, you know, we stand up here, we're not a perfect work, we don't anticipate on probably ever arriving there because it's our flesh, our sinful nature is constantly picking its head up and saying, you know, I would my way, but we have completely, and I can say that wholeheartedly, we were kind of getting emotional on the way over here because we were thinking, man, we're having an opportunity to be able to minister on marriage. And we were remembering what our marriage was like before we came to church, before we surrendered to Christ, before we said every single time that we would do it God's way. So we sat here Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, and when we heard words and everything, we said, we agree to that. We adapt that. We decide ahead of time that God's word is going to continue change us, that it's not me judging God's word. Cindy, you say that a lot of times. It's not me judging God's word. It's allowing God's word to judge me, allowing God's word Amen. to judge us. Amen. And so we'd like to just close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the marriage relationship that Amen. is close to the one that you have with your bride. Thank you, Lord. We pray that they're strengthened today, that they're encouraged. Lord, we just pray that you're glorified in it all. And we pray that no matter where we're at in, in our walk with you, that this allows us to take us deeper that we're able to surrender, that we have those decided hearts that we talked about today to say we don't want to do it our way anymore, that we want to do it your way. There's so much more to our lives and completeness and fullness and abundance when we say yes to you. In Jesus' name.
and I just thank you, Lord, for this opportunity, Lord. And it doesn't matter of our past, Lord. It only matters that you're with us. Lord, and Lord, as, as, as we close today, Lord, we want to take this opportunity, Lord, to, to acknowledge you in all our ways, Lord, but to also ask if there's anybody out there that is here with us today that hasn't accepted the Lord, that is looking for an opportunity to accept the Lord, that they can do that here at this moment. And it's just between you and God. Everybody's eyes are closed. And it's just that decision. We've been waiting. You, you have been waiting for that moment. And this could be your moment. Don't let it pass you by. And you get to answer that question of what's new. It's because God wants that newness in your life. He loves you that much. He hasn't forgot about you. He wants to bring that increase in your life. With everybody's eyes closed, if anybody here hasn't accepted Christ and wants to accept Christ, please raise your hand. God. Thank you. Yeah. Praise God for that. Now we have our work to do. We need to go find somebody. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank In you, Jesus everyone. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.